Jada Pinkett Smith, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. As you know, we're asking all of our guests what their non negotiables are, what the practices and ideas that they can't live without uh, might be. And uh, so I'll put that question to you. What are, you, what are your non negotiables? Well, first and foremost, you know, I wake up about 5 a.m. I meditate. Sometimes it's a sitting meditation, sometimes it's a walking meditation. Um, and then I will do some kind of physical um, activity, whether it's Qigong or yoga. Um, and then I am going to read some scripture of some kind. So another non-negotiable for me as well is like these days I am really trying to live my life through my relationship with, with the Great Supreme. The Great Supreme is probably one of the most important relationships in my life today. Um, and, you know, just in regards to my relationships and my work, just everything has to come through my understanding and my connection with the Great Supreme before anything else. What do you mean when you say Great Supreme? I would say God, you know, I usually, or, or universal source, that power that's higher than myself. Do you have a... A, a specific conception of God, like it, f through a Christian lens, or is it more diffuse than that? My grandmother, uh, you know, while everybody else was going to church, I grew up through an organization called the Ethical Society, where I learned about so many different religions. My grandmother was an atheist, um, but she wanted me to be able to choose whether I wanted to believe in God or not and what God that I, I wanted um, and so I do have a specific vision of God, but I usually keep it to myself because, you know, when people talk about religion and politics, things can get real sticky. <laughs> you have a view of what God is, but you don't try to, to, to voice that on other people. My personal understanding of the great Supreme is that, uh, it comes in many forms and has many faces. And so, um, you know, I leave it to when I'm speaking about the Great Supreme for people to envision what that means for them. Because what it means for me is like, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, I just leave it to whatever form and whatever face appeals to the person that's listening or that I'm talking to. You, you, you said before that having a relationship with God or the Great Supreme is central for you in terms of managing your ego? What, how, how does that work? Sometimes that level of self-centeredness can make us believe that we're all that exists, right? And I think for me, it's staying in contact with, the, with my understanding of the Great Supreme helps me to, to use my energies to be in service to something far greater than myself, right? And so trying to always think about the greater good, you know, um, versus what is um, self-serving. And it's, it's tricky, you know, because it, it, that, that's quite a practice. It's really a practice to even have the level of discernment to recognize the difference between something that's serving you and something that's serving something greater than yourself. You talk in the book, Worthy, about a uh, daily practice that you try to do. Uh, you call it surrender practice. <laughs> yeah. um, and that uh, that's that seems relevant to what we're discussing now. Is, is that? Yeah, is, okay. absolutely. Can you can you describe it? It's releasing and letting go in the moment. Right. Because any time that I feel like I have to do something in the sense of like making something happen, um, that usually is an indication that I need to let go. You know, if I'm looking for a specific outcome for something, which I'm so used to, I'm just learning how to let go, take a moment and just let it be and just give it over. And that's something that I, I have to do often throughout the day <laughs> because I'm so used to thinking of a specific outcome for things and putting all of my energy towards making it, making that outcome happen. And I'm just learning now as I get older 
that A, I'm not that intelligent to always know <laughs> what the best outcome should be and that um, the great supreme has it all. And so I can just relax and let go. You know, that there is an energy far more intelligent than myself that has things under control. Um, and so, yeah, when that little controller within me, you know, of course we want to put our effort towards, um, you know, life. We have to live life and we, we, we do things and, and make things happen, but not allowing my little controller and that little ego within go, no, but it has to be this way and it has to turn out like this, you know? It's kind of like, no, we're here. We're in the flow. It's all good. I don't know if this will rhyme with what you're saying, but I come out of the Buddhist tradition and I know you know uh, plenty about Buddhism, but in, in Buddhism, we talk a lot about uh, non-attachment to results so yeah. that we can try really hard on something, you know, a, a book project, a, a video project, a business, a parenting endeavor, whatever it is, we can try really hard, but we exist in a universe that is chaotic and mysterious yes. and we are not in full control. And so if we can balance the effort with the wisdom of knowing we can't control everything, that seems like a route to peaceful striving. Absolutely. Peaceful striving. Peaceful striving is where it's at. And I'm I'm even getting to a place where I'm just like trying to be in tune to what am I being used for? The role that I've been given to play in this cosmic dance and being open to the idea that I might not always know my role, right? And so the ego telling me, no, 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 Jada, this is what your role is. It's like, ah, let's wait and see, <laughs> you know? And so I've been really digging on that lately as far as like allowing myself to listen to see what the role is. And you know what? Sometimes the roles we have to play are not always pleasant. And I've been digging on that as well. So there's a process, and it sounds like you have many processes for dropping your storyline, tapping into something larger, either it's the great supreme or even, even if it's maybe even it's just your body and whatever signals your body happens to be sending you. And then you can make a smarter decision that's less self-centered based on that break, that pause. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And just kind of seeing where, how is everything flowing, you know, getting into that more Taoist perspective as well. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Your book you, you, has gotten a lot of attention for, for what a personal stuff, but, uh, you you know, having to do with your family. But as I look at the material from the book, something else strikes me, which is you may be the most dedicated spiritual seeker. I don't love that term, but whatever you want to call it, like that I, I, I've run across in a long time that you, you've tried ayahuasca many, many times. You've met with Thich Nhat Hanh. You've met with other spiritual leaders. You've uh, studied in many different religious traditions. You've done therapy, medication. What What is driving all of that? What the Because the level of effort and ambition there strikes me as unusual. Just really in search for happiness in its truest form, right? And having reached a level of material success, you know, because we're told all the time that, you know, material success does it, right? And um, and just knowing that there that there is more. And when it comes to spiritual seeking, I mean, it's it's endless. And I'm always looking for um, different doors, you know, because I feel like the one thing that I've learned in, in not being afraid to being open to studying different practices is that each one has given me such a beautiful gift and a, and a, a different understanding of the great Supreme, right? Because my personal opinion is that the, the great supreme is so vast and so big that I'm learning different aspects of it through different traditions or have through different traditions and have gotten really beautiful gifts and um, different uh, like uh, sacred approaches to honoring uh, the great supreme. Um, and so even though I've 
out of everything that I have studied and learned, I do have a very specific idea of the great supreme for myself. I've gotten so many, so much beautiful understanding through meeting so many different masters from different traditions that have really helped change my life. And that to me is really ecstatic. I, it's, 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 it is the thing that gives me the most joy in life is when I'm given some different spiritual gift of some sort that enhances and nourishes my life. And then I can share it with my friends and my family if, if you know, it, it's called, if I'm called to do so or if they're interested. But that to me is life. There's so much of what you just said, but I'm, I'm just going to pick up on one thing first, which is what you said right at the beginning of that answer. Y you, by many objective modern measurements, have everything, everything, clout, fame, money, and yet something profound is and has been missing, and that is what is propelling you on this path. Yes. I'm grateful to be as privileged as I am. But even in that privilege, I was spiritually deprived. I uh, did not have the spiritual foundation that I needed to give meaning to any of it. And that's just for me. I can't say that that would be the same for, any, for everyone else. But for me personally, I really learned that having all of those material things, having that clout, having that success, wasn't nourishing the void within my, hmm. my heart, because life can just be heartbreaking. You know, it was a beautiful thing that Thich Nhat Hanh would often talk about, and it, he talked about um, suffering with grace um, and understanding the sacredness within suffering. And knowing that that is a part of the human experience. It's part of the human condition. But we can't really know that until we are willing to learn the spiritual nature of ourselves and of, of the world. And I could not understand how I could have so many things and still be so brokenhearted. Mm. And it wasn't until I really continued my my search and was really deepening my commitment that I understood that you're not unique, Jada. And that's part of the ego on the other side thinking, oh, woe is me. I'm the only one who suffers like this. Nobody else is suffering, you know, all of that, right? Which is just another aspect of the ego. I mean, let me tell you, and my ego, my ego leans more towards martyrdom. <laughs> <laughs> and I really, and that was something that I had to learn and discover. I never, I was like, that's ego. I just thought that was like, you know, the pain of it all. I was like, no, 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 no. You're, you're, that's not a unique position, you know? And so once I got with that, I was able to even look at some of the dramas in my life very differently, very differently, which was a blessing in itself. Just out of respect, like, um, you know, I think a lot of people in your position might have tried to milk as many worldly pleasures out of the situation as possible until they ran out of road. Like, I'm, I'm thinking about this famous quote from John D. Rockefeller, an ancient, like, rich dude, um, who was asked, how much is enough? And he said, just a little bit more. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, you know, like, you, you, I think a lot of people in your position would just be like, all right, I'm going to paper over this existential angst with more achievement, more money, a, a new tequila line, uh, you know, new, you know, some branded high heels, whatever it is, drugs, uh, is th any kind of thrill, shopping, whatever. Um, but you actually said, no, I'm actually I'm going to try to learn more. And what you learned actually brought you into experiencing really in a raw way the broken heartedness that you're referencing, it, leaning into the grief, which is not something most people are willing to do. And it sounds like that is what you are doing now. 
Yeah, let me tell you, and I get it. Let me just let me just say that. I so understand why people run. <laughs> you know, Lord knows I did for a long time until I hit a rock bottom. I hit I hit such a dark place. You know, I talk about in the book where I'm 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 looking for cliffs to drive over. You know, because I got to a place that I wanted I wanted to end my life, but I didn't want my kids to think that I ever committed suicide. You know, because it was so painful and I could not see a way out. Because here I am with everything a person could ever have and still miserable. And I was confused because I was turning 40. So I think it was 2012 or 2011. And nobody was talking about mental health in the way that people talk about it today. And it was still really taboo. And I had tried all different kinds of therapy, you know, and it just didn't, it didn't get me to where, it didn't get me to the happy that I was looking for. And so reaching a rock bottom like that, And I and today I'm grateful for that rock bottom because it was an extreme circumstance that needed to happen in order to get me on to the path that I'm on now. And you know, I wish we didn't have to have rock bottoms like that. But sometimes when we're dealing with the strong energies that pull us in this world and the way that they do, those energies that'll make us believe, man, go ahead and get that shoe line, man, try that cocaine, man, you know, hit another bottle of that, you know, alcohol. It'll make us think that looking for that instant gratification for the moment you know, to just get us through whatever we're going through in that moment. And we'll just keep in these cycles you know, but I'm grateful for rock bottoms for those of us who can survive them. You mentioned Thich Nhat Hanh, the great Zen master, um, a few paragraphs ago, and you said that he said something about the sacredness of grief or suffering. Suffering. And what about suffering is sacred to you? Getting in contact with compassion. When we allow ourselves to sit in our broken hearts and we can be with the intense feelings of grief and despair and disappointment. It teaches us so much about ourselves as well as about others. When we learn about our own suffering and we're willing to be with it in a certain manner, it helps us to understand how people around us are suffering as well. And we can realize that we're not alone. And we can realize that we can actually help ourselves and others through the suffering. And that's what makes it sacred because it brings us closer to it can, if we're willing to surrender, brings us closer to love. It brings us closer to um, feeling more connected to ourselves, which then offers more authentic connection to others. And that's what this is about, being here in this place. We're all here just simply trying to help each other, walk each other home, you know, to our hearts, our souls, you know, for those of us who choose to want to have deeper connections with our understanding of the great Supreme. Yeah. I mean, that really jives with the way I've experienced it, which is if you can do this deeply counterintuitive thing of <laughs> feeling your pain <laughs> yeah. as opposed to running from it, <laughs> yeah, it will do two things for you. At least one is it will 
put you in touch with the truth, the small T truth, like the way things are, you know, for everybody, we are all talk about non-negotiables. We're all going to get sick and die. Yeah. And everybody we know is going to get sick and die. So suffering is, you know, part of the package. Uh, so feeling it as opposed to running with it puts you in touch with the truth. And then it inexorably, in my experience, leads you to seeing, oh, yeah, th I'm not, as you said before, I, Jada, I, Dan, I'm not unique. This is happening for everybody. So can I be useful in the face of that um, situation? And by the way, the being useful makes me feel better. Yeah, and it, it makes me feel like I'm in service. The 10% Happier Podcast is available ad-free over on our companion meditation app, which is also called 10% Happier. And uh, you will get uh, the episodes a week before everybody else does. Download the 10% Happier app right now to get started for free. You referenced walking each other home, which is a... I believe a quote from Ram Das, who's the probably um, I yeah, love Ram. <laughs> for people who don't know him, he's a, you know he's a great he's actually a um, a white guy from the Boston area who um, whose name was Richard Alpert and um, got in a little trouble at Harvard for uh, giving his students um, <laughs> acid or something like that shrooms yeah. yeah and then went off to India and became Ram Das and actually became a quite uh, influential and incredible teacher and in. Your book, you you talk about another quote from Ram Das that I'd love to get you to talk about now. Uh, here it is. We have to learn how to have an open heart in hell. Hell, yes. That's one of my favorites. Yeah. It's learning how to allow the heart to be elastic in really uncomfortable situations, right? So... Here's where I've done a lot of practice in regards to surrendering the ego because just like you said, it's so counterintuitive. So if you're being attacked or, you know, if you're somebody is sharing something with you that is painful, you know, the first thing my ego wants to do is fight, right? And I've had to learn how to surrender that fight and tell myself that that fight hasn't serviced me, hasn't worked. And then just be willing to open my heart to love and allowing loving presence to be what is in the midst of this uncomfortable situation that's making me want to shut down, fight, become callous and hard and protect myself. I've learned that love is the greatest shield. It really is. And it is about being able to open your heart in hell, opening your heart when it's not the most ideal circumstances because check it, it's easy to, to love when, you know, the circumstances are ideal and exactly what you want them to be. It's like, who are we when they're not? So I have, a, I have two choices. I can help create more of the same I can add more aggression, hatred uh, in the world, or I can be with the hatred and aggression of this world with an open heart. And it's a hell of a practice. Let me tell you a story that I think is relevant and get, see what you think of it. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. For my 50th birthday, a very close friend of mine is a, is a great meditation teacher. Her name is Sebene Selassie. And she gave me a painting that she uh, that a friend of hers who she she said was an intuitive. I don't even know what that means. But she, the friend made this painting and she bought it from the friend and gave it to me. And it's hanging in my office. And as I was hanging it up, I saw in the back that it was called the title of the painting was My Open Heart Keeps Me Safe. Mm. And now... The way, the way I'm wired, I see language like that and I think yeah, I'm a very skeptical, anti-sentimentalist guy. And so I don't like language like that. So I hear it. I'm like, oh, this is some new age bullshit. But I decided because Seven A is a genius that I would take this phrase on as like a riddle that I would sit with for a second. And at first I was like, well, how would being open in the face of the dumpster fires of the world help me or make me safe, less anxious. Um, 
But over time, and I don't even know if I can articulate it under pressure here, I, I've come to agree with it, even if I don't love the verbiage. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll stop talking and see if any of that lands for you. Oh, that lands big time being turned off by verbiage like that. Like I, <laughs> I'm the same way. I'm just like, you know, but I've learned that, man, I've, I've had, that's been part of my practice too, just being able to accept that usually, you know, all of those little quotes or what have you, like, you know, you, know, you got to embrace your inner child. It's like, ah, oh, don't talk to me about my inner child, please. But it's all true. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's all true. But yeah, just, yeah, having an open heart to me, I've, I've learned this created the, the greatest safety. It's like it, it envelops and dismantles, it dissolves and softens um, all of the, it, it makes the, the, the hate of the world not non-existent as if you know, it's 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 not here, but non-existent in the fact that it's not necessarily real. And that's what it's taught me. And that most hate that's projected is one's own self-hatred that they're dumping into the world, right? And that's, I've learned not to take it personally. People are just trying to figure out what to do with their own personal lack of self-love. I've learned to have a lot of compassion around that. And the only reason I've learned to have compassion around that is getting in contact with my own self-hatred and my own lack of self-love and how that made me behave. That's the only reason why I really understand is because I had to walk through the shadows of my own heart. I had to walk through the shadows of my own psyche to really take, take a really deep look at myself. And when I was willing to do that, I could see how that my behavior mirrored behavior in the world that I found hurtful towards me. I was like, oh. I, I I do the same thing. It's like, oh, I get it. Okay, got it. Projection. Okay. And then I realized, oh, so none of that is real. None of that is real. And so the love just kind of when you can just be with it and you can you can sit with it in that way, it just dispels the illusion of it. <laughs> Let me see if I can rearticulate this just to put a fine point on it. This is mostly for just to make sure I understand it because I'm actually writing about this. So this is useful for me in my own work. Um, so the way Jada and Dan see this is um, that intuitive painter, whatever her name is, is right because if you close your heart, whether we like that language or not, if you armor up against your own nonsense and the nonsense of the world, it's not going to work in the long run, it's not a sustainable strategy because you are too small. We are too small uh, yes. and our mind is too complex. It's going to get in. It's going to find a way through the armor. Yep. So the the crazy but most effective move is to drop those ego, ego walls, get close with our own inner turmoil, allow that to have a different view of other people's inner turmoil so that we don't take their nonsense so personally. That's right. And can even empathize with them because we see how we could do the same thing if we came out of that womb and ex experienced the same things. That's right. And so that's the closest we're going to get to safety in a chaotic world. Yeah. That's how having an open heart would keep us safe. Is that am I in the neighborhood of correct here? Absolutely. And I think it's the greatest I think it's the greatest contribution that we can make in helping to change the world. Hmm. so that we don't add more of that energy into the world that, you know, creates more of the same. I don't know. I, are, are, do you watch Lord of the Rings? 
I watched the original movies. Didn't love the Amazon reboot, um, but I did watch the original, the original ones, right? Yes. So do you remember when those, um, I forget what you call them, but those creatures were coming out of the the ground and all of that darkness was about to take over the world. And it was like millions of them. And it seemed like it, there was no way that, you know, they could be conquered because it was so many of them. And the then orcs. The orcs. And then the wizard comes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, it, it might have been what? Six of them? Six of them, 10 of them at best. And he comes with his, you know, crystal ball and he, you know, this light shines through and dispels all of that darkness. Right? And so the, the subtle way that love works. I also talk about a lot of times when I, I um, refer to like how much shadow it takes for to be seen in a room full of light. So if we're in a room full of light. How much shadow has to, you know, fill the room for it to even be noticed versus when we're in a room of darkness, how much light needs to come into that room before it's recognized? A speck. So I say all that to say that because just because love itself might not always be so loud, it is far more potent than how loud negative energy can be. Mm -hmm. And I always refer to that. I either think about the, the Lord of the Rings <laughs> moment <laughs> with the crystal ball, or I think about the idea of, shadow having to pour into a room of light and how much it would take to be seen. Yeah, I used to be a news anchor, so I traveled around the world, um, you know, watching the worst thing, mm. the worst things that humans do to other humans. And, yeah. um, you know, I want to believe in the power of love, and I do in some, I do deeply. Um, and at the same token, like, by the same token, I, I mean, there are a lot of orcs. Um, and so I, I just kind of think, I don't know who's who or what's going to win in the end, but I do know that it is possible f for each of us to take care of our own shit, to to do this pro do these processes that you're talking about here, get comfortable with our own ugliness, and therefore to be better in the world, and that we will be increasing the quotient of sanity by doing that, yeah. and that we will be happier in the process too, and um. And that I feel like is the best any one individual can do. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. That's all we're here to do. And we got to let the great Supreme figure out the rest. I do want to get you to clarify one thing, because in case people are confused, when we're talking about having an open heart, that does not mean you're a doormat. In your book, you talk a lot about boundaries. So can you say, say something about that? Yeah, open heart does not mean, you know, um, unconditional tolerance um and that's where we really because I, I, for a long time i believed that being loving was allowing anybody to do whatever they wanted you know what i mean it's like oh you just have to allow because you know that's part of loving it's like no 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 we also have to protect our peace you know, it's like I always think about those Buddha statues or those Kuan Yin statues that simply a hand up, you know, it's just like stop right there as kind of like that boundary, creating that boundary or pulling out the velvet sword um, because we have to be our own warriors of light, you know, and using as, you know, Love isn't always just about, you know, moonbeams and uh, <laughs> freaking, you know, fairy dust. You know, sometimes love has to be extremely fierce. I mean, I think about the goddess Kali in the Hindu tradition. You know, here she is with her tongue out and she's got the machete and she's got a garland of skulls around her neck. You know, she is the ultimate boundary setter, but it's through through love and it takes a lot of personal development 
for us to understand the difference between setting loving boundaries and setting boundaries from a place of resentment, revenge, mm. uh, hate, you know, all of those energies, because that's, that's a different kind of boundary setting, right? And so we have to be patient with ourselves through that process. And I didn't necessarily have that information. So I only knew how to set boundaries from a place of anger. So when I was starting my, my becoming aware of my love practice, I thought that any time I set a boundary was an act of unkindness. Hmm. And it was, right? Because of where it was coming from. Hmm. But setting boundaries is not an act of unkindness. Where I was coming from in setting the boundary was. So I really had to learn how to set boundaries from, for myself from a different place. And that is a practice because listen, we're all taught how to set boundaries from anger, resent from all those other places. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so it just takes time, but yeah, love being in an open heart does not mean you are a doormat, not at all, but it definitely takes some real study and, 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 um, practicing to 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 get that balance i always talk about this bumper sticker i once saw on the uh, on the rear of a subaru at a meditation retreat i was attending and it and the bumper sticker said i'm all love and light and a little bit of go fuck yourself <laughs> that's it yeah there it is you know there it is with love <laughs> yeah. before i let you go tell me about the title worthy yeah the title it was a it was a word that i was using a lot in the book and so i would talk about in the book a lot like trying to find my worth like my value and at first i wanted to name the book unlovable because i was like ooh everybody feels unlovable and my editor was like okay we might feel unlovable but nobody wants to buy a book <laughs> called unlovable. <laughs> and since I use the word worthy, that's what we're all in search of. You know, we're in search of our, our self-worth, you know, for ourselves, really. I mean, we think, we think we want to feel worthy to others, which, you know, but I think what we oftentimes are using others as a reflection, you know, to help us feel a certain way about ourselves. And I was like, wow, if we can all just get to that place of feeling worthy, you really care less about what's happening with others and what others think about you when you really have your sense of self-worth and that, that feeling of feeling worthy. I decided to name the book that, and I wanted it to be a reminder when it's on people's shelf that, you know, they're worthy, you know, because even though the book is about my journey, I'm hoping and from from what I'm discovering from people who have who are reading it and have read it, that it also reflects the journey of others. And so it's, it's our worthy journey. It's not just my worthy journey, but I feel like it's, you know, it's just one look at a journey towards self-worth that I think is pretty universal. I, I I'll just pick up on what you said before about how, you know, self-love can sound like an empty cliche and people might not like the language of love generally, you know, uh, loving other people. But generally, you're, you're not going to get a lot of criticism if you're talking about love. But if properly understood, love should be omnidirectional. So you shouldn't be left out of it. Right. right. If you're a loving person, you should you should be included in the love. And that means setting boundaries and it means having enough self-worth to send love not from a needy place but from a um a full cup um and i i feel like this is something that isn't widely understood and and yet you're explaining it quite well well thank you i appreciate that <laughs> 
Well, let me take a risk and say something. Ask you a question. I don't know if this how this is going to land, but um, okay. I have not followed the book publicity, your book publicity, super closely. But to the extent that I've followed it, it seems like it's focused on a lot of stuff that, yeah, is in the book, but isn't core to my understanding of the book. And right. so it's not my I'm not your agent. I'm not your editor. I mean, we don't, we just met and on video, so we don't even really know each other. But um, it seems to me that you're a person who has done an enormous amount of interpersonal, intrapersonal, spiritual investigation in your life. Uh, and that doesn't seem to be the thing that people are asking you about. Mm. Am, I, am, I, am I understanding this correctly? Do you agree with that diagnosis? Yeah, I do agree with that. And I think, you know, that's the clickbait, right? And that is, I think, unfortunately, people sometimes lean into some of the personal stuff, which, like you said, is not the core of the book at all. You know, but I think they feel as though that's what would get the ratings and what gets the attention. I don't know because of what my life is if if it if it would have been avoidable. I was actually just talking to my publicist, who also happens to be a really good friend of mine, about this the other day. I was just like, "Wow, you know, is there a different way?" this, we could have approached this book. And I just, every which way I think about it, it, it was going to, it was going to be noisy in that way at some point, you know, I, it was just unavoidable, unfortunately. But I do, one of the things I do love is that people who are reading the book see that the book is, is not that. It's a real treat for those who, who get beyond the headlines. Well, maybe that's the positive spin here, which is that you made some noise. The noise was unavoidable. You made it. But that might have brought a lot of people to the book who otherwise wouldn't have read it. And then from the book, they're getting something that's not noise that is useful. And so maybe the noise served a purpose. Yeah. I mean, listen, once again, it goes back to how we started the conversation. I just had to surrender. I'm like, the great Supreme knows better than me. <laughs> you know, it's like. Because that surely wasn't, you know, that that wasn't what I was hoping for. But, you know, everything happens the way it's supposed to. That's what I do know. You know, everything's in divine order, even if it doesn't go exactly the way that I had envisioned. I do know that it's all in divine order. Jada Pinkett Smith, a total pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for making time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. This was awesome. So great to talk to you. 